Loving Father, we're so grateful to you for your, your patience with us and your mercy. Many of us in this room have been uh, coming together for several decades, and we pray that that time that we will continue to be needing to do this will soon end, not because we got discouraged, but because finally you're able to come back and take your children home. Pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding for the message for this time, and speak through Todd now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. thank you. So the second angel's message, um, Revelation 14, 8, is what we generally refer to. And when I got this uh, assignment, if you want to call it that, <laughs> Bob thought, wow, that's short. <laughs> <laughs> One verse. <laughs> um, so Revelation 14, 8, and another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wrath of her fornication. Um, and then I got to thinking, um, maybe it was the uh, inspiration of Fred or something. Uh, there's all kinds of places you can go with this. But uh, what, is, what is this verse saying? Well, we know there's another angel. I'm not going to emphasize that too much. Someone dealt with that last night. This angel um, is following a first, the first angel. Um, and the first angel's message, which we just heard about, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, sea and everything that's in it, right? Um, and then right on the tail, on the heels of that, Babylon is fallen, has fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So there's, there's probably more than four ways we can look at this. Um, I put four up here. What does it mean to fall? What is Babylon? What is, why is it called that great city? And what does it mean that she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication from these different perspectives? We know the cosmic perspective, we call that what? The great controversy theme. Uh, the prophetic uh, perspective, which um, we touched on, and we'll read a statement shortly. Um, the early, how did the early Adventists see the second angel's message, and how was it fulfilled prophetically? Uh, I put corporate up there because, well, it's part of our DNA, right? <laughs> um, because these judgments and the the falling that happens in these judgments that God pronounces happen to entities and they happen because you know um, of what that corporate responsibility is and then of course the personal application um, I don't know whether it was Jones or Wagner who had said something about you know you we can come out of Babylon mm -hmm. but does has Babylon come out of us and um, so let's just read this together. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen in that great city. The, the text is quoted. Come out of her, my people. Then Revelation 18.4, which of course is a repetition, if you will, of the second angel's message. This author says, this second angel did not go on his mission and deliver his message in company with the first angel. Um, but he followed after, which is a little different. I, I don't think, I mean, I agree with what Kelly presented last evening because I think there are concurrent issues. And of course, you, Ellen White actually quoted, well, you quoted her saying that was, which is interesting in this context. Do you know who this is speaking? No? No? This is James White. <laughs> so this is her husband in 1850. <laughs> Most husbands are less inspiring than their wives, aren't they? So, I know that's true in our family. Um, the second angel did not go on his mission and deliver his message in company with the first angel, but he followed after and delivered the burden of his message. He's speaking the prophetic application, just to be clear. The first message was to, use, was to the churches, but soon their religious papers 
refused to publish it and the doors of their houses of worship were closed against it. So what was happening? The first angel's message was being proclaimed by the early Adventists. It's time for God's judgment. He's coming. And what happened when they started preaching that in their own churches? They were thrown out. They were persecuted to the point where they were disenfranchised. Um, and you could look back all the way to the early Christian church, maybe in the 100s and 200s, where it started to be the bishops started to compete with each other and they had differences in doctrine. And if you didn't believe the way I did, then, you know, it was problems for you. You were no longer in the church, right? So you see that. In this way, shut out, they shut out the everlasting good news of the coming kingdom. And when that was accomplished, Jesus and the spirit of truth left them forever. And the churches of Babylon, that should say, or fell. There were a few living souls in all these churches who had received the Advent message, whose meat and drink and very life was to talk of the coming of Jesus and the restitution. But they were not allowed to bear their, that testimony that is in their own churches. Then the way was fully prepared for the second message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. Every Advent believer knows that we heard just this message. We have not forgotten the excellent sermons that were preached and published by elders Joseph Marsh and many others on this very point. Neither have we forgotten the effect that it had upon God's people, for they obeyed the message and with haste left the churches. So at this particular point in time, in the development of the Adventist movement, um, the, there was a rejection and a persecution that then was... Um, that caused the confusion of these people in these daughters of Babylon, if you will, um, to be so cleared up that people came out. Now, come out of Babylon is part of which message? We call it the third angel's message, don't we, right? The third angel says, come out of her, my people, that she not be. So, so they even viewed the beginning of the third angel's message starting at this point. This prophecy was exactly fulfilled and in the right time and place. Some tell us that Babylon here is the Roman Catholic Church. Is that what we often think of when we think of Babylon? I mean, it's true for me. I, I say, oh, well, that's the Babylonian system and, you know, righteousness by works. What? Your righteousness said it can't be. Can't be, yeah. Well, here's what James White is saying. But God's people were not in that church. Well... Some of them might have been, I suppose. The first message was to the churches from about 1840 to 1843. And the second angel followed. Therefore, the message, Babylon has fallen, come out of her, my people, was in 1844. We heard it with our ears, our voices proclaimed it, and our whole being felt its power. And with our eyes, we saw its effect. And the oppressed people of God burst the bands that bound them to the various sects and made their escape from Babylon. So that's 1850. Yeah, right about, right about then. So here he's writing in 1853, um, and he's talking in the past tense again. The second angel's message has been fulfilled. He uh, quotes it again, and he says, He does not proclaim this message at the time of the first, but follows after. It is a well-known fact that the burden of the first message was given from 1840 to the first part of 1844. So that's when he came in. And that the announcement was made in 1844, and the burden of that message, which called many thousands from the different churches, closed in the autumn of 1844. And this is interesting. This movement being local, the angel is not said to make his proclamation with a loud voice. It's been mentioned, what's the explanation here? You know, you have the first and the third angel's message very loud. The second angel is just there. It's not with a loud voice. Why is that? And we'll maybe get into that. But his, his point is... Uh, He's saying it's not because it's local. The first angel announces the hour of God's judgment with a loud voice. The fulfillment was a mighty movement which took hold of the public mind. The solemn announcement of the third angel is made with a loud voice. And this is the period of preparatory work of another mighty movement in fulfillment of the third angel's loud cry. So he's recognizing there's going to be a loud cry. It's going to, and then the mighty movement, what does that make you think of? The fourth angel of Revelation 18. So he's already pre, you know, he's seeing that coming. Okay, so let's just, let's do a bit of a Bible study and just see um, what connections we see in 
in this um, text. What is the meaning of Babylon? You know, I, I remember hearing Jack Sequera talk about this, and I was I, then I would go to Strong's Concordance, and it would say it means confusion, yeah. or I'm like, well, so I'd like I, now that I had this assignment, I had to try and figure <laughs> out what was going on. So the native name uh, in the in in the um, Akkadian name was Babylon, meaning gate of God. So that's where he got that. And uh, the the confusion, if you want to, if you want to call it confusion, or the alternate view is comes from Genesis eleven nine. Therefore, is the name of it called Babel, the Tower of Babel, because there the Lord did confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad on all the face of the earth. So the name is called Babel, because the Lord there did confound. Now this word for confound is. Uh, derived from another word, um, balal, which means to confound. So the confusion or the mixing up, um, so that both, both definitions, if you will, are in that verse in chapter 11 of Genesis, Genesis 11, 9, yes. <clears throat> just a thought that just came to my mind, but... Uh... I always kind of thought that the Tower of Babel was a way of people escaping another flood. But the original definition you just put up there sounds like they were actually trying to find God. It was really a religious movement, and it's them trying to find God on their own, right? Right. If they could get to the heavens where the gods were, then they could control the weather for the common good. Well, I shouldn't go too far. But, yeah, go far. But, uh, I mean, you can see similar mindsets today which is why I think this second angel's message is still relevant. So here's how I kind of put those together. I don't know if this makes sense to you. From the pagan perspective, they're trying to reach the gate of God. From God's perspective, doing that is just going to lead to their utter confusion because they're not God and they have to rely on his promise because his promise was there won't be another flood. And they needed to rely on the gospel not on their own ability, which, of course, that theme starts earlier in, in, the, um, in the account of Scripture. So we might ask these questions, um, what is the cause and nature of the fall? Now, interestingly, uh, this word for fall is just is to fall. It can be a moral fall. It can be a literal fall. It can be, and it's probably... Well, at different times in history, I mean, the, the walls of Babylon, physical Babylon, historical Babylon, did fall. But it was because of a moral fall, right? And uh, a failure to humble themselves. What's the significance of is fallen, is fallen? Verily, verily. When Christ spoke, when a word is repeated in Scripture, what does it mean? This is a, a definite, definite thing, definite emphasis, which is, um, so the, the meaning of, uh, of this, as I said, is to fall down. I mean, this is very small type here, but uh, to cast down from a state of prosperity, to fall from a state of uprightness, to lose authority, no longer have force. So you, does that, is that included in the fall of Babylon in Revelation 14.8? to perish, to fall down, anyway, to fail of participating and to miss a share in. See, what is it that causes Babylon to fall? What have they missed out on? Um, to be removed from power. So, okay, moving on in the text, um, that great city. Now, that great city, anybody know the Greek? Jerry, is Jerry here? What is Greek great city? What great city? The the Greek words for great great there is mega, 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 and the word for city in Greek is polis. polis. Everybody probably a lot of people know that. So, megapolis or a big city, a large city. Well, what is what is great mean? Splendid, grand, uh, of God's preeminent blessings. You know, he has great blessings, but 
what, it's, what does it say in um, Desire of Ages? That all of God's blessings became to the, to the Jews? A curse, right? All that he intended. It's in the chapter on the rock. If you don't fall on the rock, the rock falls on you. Um, but of things which overstep the province of, cre- of a created being, pr- or proud, presumptuous things, full of arrogance, derogatory to the ma- majesty of God. So, what's the fundamental problem of Babylon? Arrogance, Arrogance pride, um, the creature taking the place, or trying to take the place, trying to reach the place. Self-exaltation. Self-exaltation. She has made all nations drink. Now, if you make somebody drink water, what do we call that? Collusion. Waterboarding. Waterboarding. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, that and it is a form of torture, right? You make somebody feel like they're dying, even though they're not. I interested. I I listened to a or read the account of this guy who worked for the CIA and. He actually, before they did this on the people around, you know, the after the um, 9-11 event, um, they actually practiced it on themselves to see what it was like and, you know, make sure they were doing it with doctors, you know, kind of watching, over, you know, it's like. <laughs> um, but f- forcing someone to drink, she has made all nations drink. That word made in the Greek is the same as the word drink. So it's drinking nations drink. So it's the same kind of, this is a, more of a negative connotation, right? It's force, but the words are repeated in the Greek. But what is drinking in this context? What does it mean to drink something? Taking the philosophy and principles. Adapting the lifestyle. Yeah, so either the behavior or, well, first it starts with behavior, and then if there's no religious liberty, or as religious liberty wanes, and the behaviors can't, you know, it's amazing. I've, I've been listening to the Two Republics on E.G. White Audio. It's a great way to get the book because, I don't know, if I had a hard time just reading it. It's very, you know... But listening, you know, you, it's like a story and all these interesting things are happening. And, and E.G. White Audio. Okay. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's Mike McCabe that's, that's doing the um, mm-hmm. narration. So that's a long, long narration. I just finished the chapter on what is true, Protestant, true and false Protestantism. It's like a four hour long <laughs> chapter. I'm sure he didn't do that all at once. But point is if if people don't agree if if you if you have a um, a Babylonian philosophy where it's human ism it's human derived and people don't want to go along with it you only have force and coercion to promote yourself it's not love as the great motivator and so eventually you start forcing people to do what you want them to could it also be that that the, the natural tendency is actually to yearn for what has been offered. So it's not only that this is wrong, but there is there is you know, Babylon in us that appears that 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 is back to the to the philosophy that's been offered. That's exactly. Well, how are, so here? Uh, this is kind of open-ended question. How are these descriptors interrelated? The wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, what is wine? Doctrines, teachings. Are there doctrines that are appealing to the natural flesh? Yes. See, that's it's what you're saying. It's intoxicating. You can do this. You're great. Again. <laughs> Sorry. That's like... <laughs> what? Said shots fired. Yeah. So wrath. That word I didn't. Um, I haven't put up the word here for that, but it's basically anger or passion or... Um, and then, does everybody know what fornication is? Mm-hmm. It's bad. It's <laughs> bad. <laughs> well, what did God design? He designed for marriage to be a picture of how He wants to be united to us. And 
there are ideas of who God is, how we're united to him, um, how he unites to us, how he influences us, how, he, um, how we experience him that are not the true union that he has in mind. So it's not just that Babylon um, is, you know, promotes immorality in the, the behavioral sense. It's that Babylon promotes a picture of God, a way of relating to God that is self, still self-focused and self, self-based. Any other thoughts on that? Yes. Sometimes translated passionate unfaithfulness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you, can you think of any passages in the Old Testament that describe that? Hosea, um, where is it, where does, what book does uh, the writer? Kind of talks about the two daughters that are unfaithful. Right, okay. And, and even running, you know, it's, it's not enough that you, you gave yourself to these foreign gods, you, you, you're paying them to do this to you, you know, this kind of thing, right? I think what, what Rob said is kind of important because it's a little odd formulation of to, if we use wrath as anger or hostility to then link that with fornication. Like what's what's the anger part related to fornication? It seems a little odd linkage there, but I think if we, as Rob was pointing to, passionate feelings, then it sort of fits better. Um, than it's true. I mean, if you're, well... I the why of the anger of a fornication? It's sort of odd, right? Yeah, go ahead. Well, you can kind of uh, hear it in Jesus' day. If you look at um, Herodias, how she treated people, that was an adulterous situation. The wrath there caused the beheading of John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Well, we have, we have a word for, for fornication that is done in wrath. Rape. It's called rape. Um, and that's kind of the picture some people have of God. Now, you're, you're talking about on the kind of the willing surface end, I guess, of the equation, that is... I think this broadens the definition of wrath beyond anger. Yes. Because anger doesn't really fit in this little phrase. It would be sort of odd, right? The anger mm-hmm. of a fornication. People were drinking the anger of a fornication. Yeah. Or what would it lead to anger because of the fornication? I wonder if it was a consequential statement. That like it's, mm-hmm. it's the consequence. Like They will receive wrath because of... Okay, yeah, it could be causal, and if cause and effect... Mm-hmm. When I think of fornication, in the sense, I think of an intimacy with someone or somebody that you're not, the guy does not intend us mm-hmm. to have, you mm-hmm. get mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the science tells us that the most satisfied relationships are those that are committed marriage relationships. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because of agape. Mm-hmm. You, you're there to serve, to bless. Whereas fornication is a projection of self love onto someone else for your purposes, right? So that's what Babylon is doing theologically, right? What they're teaching of how God works, which was what? The original accusation against God, right? As to who he was. We'll get into So there's our text again. Another angel followed saying, so let's look at this from cosmic, prophetic, corporate, and personal aspects. So let's do some study. Let's turn to somebody you want to read for us, um, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, and see how many of these aspects of the way Babylon works, or what what we've described in the second angel's message, or what we see there, how that has been, uh, there from maybe from the beginning. So, anybody have that? So, as you've fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, oh, you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to shield to the lowest depths of the pit. Okay, go back in the chapter, verse 4, 
This is a proverb against the king of Babylon. 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 So we're right on track here. How has the oppressor ceased? There you have, you know, this greatness oppressing. How has the golden city ceased? And you, we can read more of the text, of course. You can scan down and see that. But what do you see related to the second angel's message here? The weakening of the nations. Okay. Fallen. Fallen. Okay, so there's fallen. What is it that makes Lucifer fall? What's the, what's the process of him falling? He wants to go up. He wants to go up. Exactly. So I will ascend. I will exalt. I will sit on. So what does he want to do? He wants to take God's place. Um, but there's a moment you get to a certain point in this process, just like the builders of the Tower of Babel, when God says, no, this is, this is going to stop. And he does stop it. But the great controversy is not just God stopping evil. It's how he stops it and how this happens. So, okay. Um, anything else? So that's, that's the cosmic perspective, if you will. Uh-huh. In verse 6, it says, He who ruled the nations in anger, speaking of Babylon, there is your wrath here. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the cosmic. What about prophetic? Is there a prophetic significance to this passage? Did this actually happen to yes. Babylon in prophecy? Yes. yes. It did. Okay. Will this happen to Satan himself? Yes. In the future, yes. is it prophetic of that? Yes. Okay. With sixteen to sixteen and seventeen, you should be brought down. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Nineteen and twenty, the destruction of Babylon and the destruction of Satan himself in twenty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's almost a restatement of the millennium. Sixteen mm -hmm. through. Right. This time when you know they just look at you for a thousand years. What's going on. There's contemplation. Mm -hmm. What happened? Okay. Now for a little closer application, as. Uh, Christians as Seventh-day Adventists or as a corporate group, do, is there an application for us? I think um, I'm quoting from a paper that Fred wrote, The Fall of Babylon. He says, the pride, he said, the pride, and the, human, the pride of the human heart is nothing unique to Babylon. It traces back through Adam and Eve to the, the first great rebel who fathered the lie that to be like the most high, he had to exalt himself. Self-exaltation was the core problem with Jesus' disciples doing their walk with him before the cross. So do we see that problem developing in the corporate church after he left? Yes. It's called the great falling away, right? So, so we see that, and we can contemplate, you know, if we have had that issue in our own fellowship, have there been self-exalting people that want to rise higher in church organization for their own purposes? Have you ever run across anyone like that? Um, of course. So how does God deal with that? And then personally, how do we apply this personally? Because there's, as we've heard it said, there's a little Babylon. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like a little Hitler in each of us, right? There's a little Babylon. Yes, go ahead, Kelly. Kind of going back to corporately church and bringing that home, the church may appear as... As if? About to... Fall. The church is not Babylon, but in, in order to appear as it's about to fall, it must be adopting some principles and allowing some principles to come in. Yeah, what is it that makes the church about to fall? Good, excellent point. Okay. Um, and and if, we, if we think in our own experience, have you ever, well, I'll just tell you one of mine. Um, great day in surgery, things are going well, I've done all the cases, I'm such a great surgeon. <laughs> And then I have one of the worst complications yeah. of, or mistakes yes. during surgery that I've ever made. Right there. That's right. So, whenever that thought crosses my mind again, yeah. I'm like, get behind. <laughs> Lord, help me not hurt this patient. Okay, so Ezekiel 28. You can think of your own. Ezekiel 28. Uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter. 
you all know it probably fairly well, and it's similar along the lines to what we read in Isaiah. Uh, maybe a few other details here. Um, this is to the king of Tyre. We start in verse 12, the last part. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. It goes on to describe all of that. You were the anointed cherub, verse 14. So this again is talking about Lucifer. Verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. You see similar themes to Revelation 18 and what we and Revelation 14, 12. It's actually, it's the peddling of information. Like he was selling trafficking ideas that led to that fall. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's enraptured the surrounding nations, that drinking of that wine and the teachings. Right. Yeah. And would you say that's also the application in Revelation 18? Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe in a little more detail. Yeah. It's interesting how these Old Testament passages are very, you know, intimately tied. Mm -hmm. um, and when we get to Jeremiah 50 and 51, maybe some of you are familiar with that, that it's extensive, and we'll get there in a little bit, I guess. But, uh, okay, your heart was lifted up. There's the, the lifting up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of splendor. And then the last part of verse 17, I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze upon you. So any other insights that you see um, in addition to what we read in Isaiah in terms of the cosmic picture? Obviously this is, who's the king of Babylon? Who's the real king of Babylon? Satan. Satan himself. It's not the Pope, it's Satan, right? Okay. Um, where did the, where did the, um, and the problem began in heaven, right? There was war in heaven. At, at what point do you think I mean, we have the spirit of prophecy. So you know the, the story of how God, Jesus Christ himself labored with mm -hmm. Lucifer, we're told. Yeah. So there's like this, there's this um, kind of a development that happens. And I, I think this may have something to do with, so in, in the second angel's message, we have it given by an angel without a loud voice. Then there's time that passes. The third angel's message begins, Kelly, right? And then the second angel's message is also echoed again in the loud cry in Revelation 18 with much more force. So did this something similar happen in heaven with Lucifer? You know, he was, we're told that at one point he confessed that he was wrong. That he, he, he was convinced that God was right and that he was wrong. But then what happened? The other angels came and said they were on his side and that he couldn't swallow his pride. So, so having followers and you being at the head of something creates a, a challenge. And then, so, but then the Revelation uh, tells us, is it Revelation 12? There was war in heaven. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point, it, it looks like to me that Satan tried to force his way into this. And I imagine God saying, no, this is the limit. It's kind of like the Tower of Babel. You're trying to build your kingdom here. These angels are not on your side. We're going to... It's almost as if God intervenes to save those who are not rebellious, which is a theme we'll see throughout Scripture. And, I, and you see um, in Revelation what, as, as Mark pointed out, um, Christ is the rescuer of his people. He's the one who defends them. He's the righteous judge. So all of these, I think, play into this theme. Well, let's go back to... Yes, go ahead. So um, I don't think we should forget that I believe that the majority of angels sided with Lucifer initially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think it was uh, that she says something about half or something so like that. The point is, during this laboring, Christ mm -hmm. won back some of the angels. Right. So, so it wasn't without an effect. So Babylon, that self-exalting spirit right. was a failure. The very act of exalting self is a failure because how did Christ win the victory? He lowered himself. He, lowered himself. he humbled himself. That was the victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. So when you said there was a time that Lucifer was convinced 
And then what hit me, the personal application is, there's a big difference between being convinced and being converted. Mm -hmm. And that's where that personal application, and that was that was still something that needed to happen, that use of everybody would not yield to it, and that's the same thing with us. So we might then go corporately to the Advent movement at this point and say, we came out of the Millerite movement. We're still Adventists. We believe Jesus is coming soon. We've accepted the doctrines, including the Sabbath, that came there pre-1844. Um, and that was a call to leave Babylon. But was it the loud cry? No. no. What did the loud cry need? What really needed to happen for the final, or what really needs to happen for the final call or the final declaration that Babylon has fallen? Water. Yielding to the indwelling Christ. Latter rain. The latter, that, that latter rain experience. And, and that's what the messengers were. Uh, to me, that's the, you know, there was a quote that they didn't speak it as they, what, what was it? They, 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 some of them that were preaching it aren't, Basically, they don't understand it. That was last night. But then, the only way to really preach it effectively is to experience it, which is to understand it, to know it in that sense. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just thinking about the worship aspect and how the fact that Satan had followers was enough to tip him over to not be able to have He didn't have the humility to go to them and say he's wrong. Today we're in a culture, I'm thinking about the fact that the first angel worship him who made, and now we have a whole culture of people who made themselves into little gods with followers on Instagram. And, and now it's harder when you take a stand publicly on Instagram or these social media outlets, which is some, you know, a large percent of our young people, to then maybe acknowledge I've been sort of in the wrong direction or I, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. So that uh, we're, our call is to worship Him, and it's a sobering. Yes. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Before we do uh, Ezekiel 28, what Dee said about the trading of ideas or the peddling of ideas, what are what are those ideas? I, and I don't think we have time to go into this, but someone may want to jot down Job 4. I think that's one of the clearest places where those ideas that are being peddled I've talked about. Man cannot be pure. Man cannot be just from God. Uh, God doesn't care. Is that the vision in the night? The vision in the night from the dark spirit? Yes. Nightmare of elephants. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Ricky. And the, uh, I thought the, the personal application on the second end of the message, and, and actually William Miller himself, the, the tendency that Mr. White says that his associates stopped him from going on to accept the third angel's message. So the, 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 the danger here is that, um, that, that those, it was actually Joshua Hines, his influence, that he, he drew so close to Joshua Hines in his thinking that it stopped him from actually receiving more from God. So, so there is a solemn uh, lesson there for, for uh, I think somebody said it this way, uh, comfort comes from those who agree with us, <laughs> but growth comes from those who disagree with us. Mm -hmm. Have we experienced that? <laughs> okay, let's go to Genesis 3 and verse 6. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Do you see the second angel's message here? What was she going to do? What was she doing by eating the fruit? She was trying to elevate herself, right? She was tempted to do that. And in the, in the, in the culmination of her elevating herself, she fell. So the, the context of that story. Then um, Genesis 4, 1 to 17, which is the story of Cain and Abel. We don't necessarily have to read the, the entire story. Um, there were two offerings brought. One was Cain's offering. What was the curse 
put on Adam? It'd be hard work to get the ground to grow things. So when Cain brought the things that he had worked hard in the ground to get, what, what was he showing? His hard work. His hard work. This is the result of my hard work. I'm bringing it to you, God. And was there a call, was there a statement to him that he, um, that Babylon was falling? God did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry. The wine of the wrath, right? So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Verse six, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And then we know what happened. Yes. I think the refusal to acknowledge one's wrong is a huge component here because like the whole idea of ex cathedra, for instance, is like a corporate understanding that we could never be wrong and we will never take responsibility for making mistakes. Like there's certainly some scary applications that can be found there for mm-hmm. yes. people to take responsibility as it costs all the kingdom, you know. Go ahead, Patty. Oh, she's just telling me the time. How much time do we have, Bob? Fifteen minutes. Okay, so so Cain p- appealed to the Lord for clemency, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Not to be put to death, and he got it. However, uh, he could no longer grow things by working the soil. Right? The soil was cursed. So the Lord um, basically put a stop at his legalism. Right? <laughs> so what did he do? He went out and started building cities. So the first city, Babylon, the great city, in fact, it was Nimrod shortly after him that built Babylon, right? The first builder of Babylon very shortly thereafter. What do cities function on? Cooperation, Cooperation, government, okay. Where do they get their food? Someone else has to grow it for you. Usually at, at... they do the hard work and you reap the benefit or you buy the food, right? We're all. So the whole idea of a city, this, this whole concept of of having everyone else do the work and you reap the benefit. Okay, let's go to Daniel because this story, of course, is germane to the fall of Babylon. This was the historical fall of Babylon. Daniel 4, verse 30 and Daniel 5, verse 23. Somebody want to read those two? They're kind of the key points of the of two stories that are related. Daniel 4, verse 30, and then Daniel 5, verse 23. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Okay, and then 523. I liked your inflection there. That was good. <laughs> but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have bought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified? Okay, so what do we see here as it relates to the second angel's message? Self-exaltation. Were there two uh, iterations of the second angel's message in this sequence? First was given to Nebuchadnezzar, and he was called to repent, and then he still was self-exalting. At the moment of his expression of his exaltation, he fell. Yes. That was his fall. Mm -hmm. In mercy. Mm -hmm. Now, his grandson, um, not so. So what do we see in this, uh, the second angel's message here, maybe as mirrored in Revelation 18, or... um, They praise the gods of silver and bronze and stuff. So what is that? Who are the gods of silver and bronze? Silver and bronze are created things. They're not the creator. But more than that, what did, what did he do? 
desecrated the holy things. So what does that mean? He's acting in defiance, that's for sure. In defiance of... It literally sits against the goal of heaven. Okay. I was about to say that there's like a parallel here with what you see in Revelation. There's drinking going on. There's like um, the fornication going on, if you will. And there's wrath happening here in the midst of this. And then it's a downfall of that one. You see in Revelation 18 as well. It's a downfall as a result of making nations drunk. And he has lords over the, you know, with him here in this party. Um, because of the drinking and all the other stuff. Everything that's falls to shambles. <laughs> Okay, what's the significance that they're drinking out of the vessels of the temple? I think these, these are the same temple, these are the same vessels that were brought by his grandfather. Yes, so what, yes, so, what, so what, what, what has been done is Daniel is actually saying, you knew these things. This is, this is, this is, um, so he was reviewing, he was reviewing the history and saying, this is wrong. And you knew it, you know. You, you, you know the story of your grandfather. Um, so, are we in a similar situation today? Where we've had the historical second angel's message presented in 1844, and we're between then and Revelation 18, two and three. Um, is the world in a similar? path or situation. We might mm -hmm. consider that. Okay, how about Isaiah 48, verse 20? We may not... Another thing about the drinking in the vessels, you see the mixing of the profane with the holy. Mm -hmm. Or using the holy to bring the profane, that is the, the instruments, the forms of worship, and filling it with you know, abominable, abominable things, yeah. Okay, Isaiah 48:20. All these Old Testament references, I think, throw light on what we read in Revelation. Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldees. For the voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. So leaving Babylon is tied to what? Well, or the fall of Babylon, right? Which is, your call to leave it is tied to its fall. Babylon falls not just to destroy Babylon, but to do what? Declare to, the the to what? To declare the redemption that was secured by the Lord. That's right. Yeah, that's the everlasting gospel mm. leading to the fall. The Lord has redeemed. You see, the, the gospel is the... Yes. The Babylon falls, so the the gospel is elevated at the same time. The, that is, and we'll read uh, something about that in terms of God makes Babylon fall so his people can go home. Mm -hmm. He did that historic. He did that for them, and that's what he's doing for us. Is, is that a cause and effect thing? I've always wondered this. Is it the preaching of the gospel that leads to people seeing the fallacy of Babylon and not the opposite? Mm -hmm. Amen. I think so. Um, and, and which, which means that the competition is now less available to make it more clear. But, 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 th but think about it. Look historically, when, when did people fall? When they reached the height of their self-exaltation. Which makes it much easier to proclaim the gospel that this is not the way things work, right? You can actually, maybe it's simultaneous, I don't know. You know, where you can see them falling. I mean, do we see that? Can we see that in society today? Does self-exaltation work? You know, society's what? It's falling apart with this, you know. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Uh, in the few minutes we have, how many minutes do we have left? Six. Six minutes? Well, I encourage you to look at these passages. Um, Jeremiah, because both of these, Jeremiah 50 and 51, are just full of references to Babylon and connections with the second angel's message. What's that? Yeah. Isaiah 50, 18 to 20. Um, there, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. But I will bring back Israel to his home and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. His soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found. For I will pardon those 
whom I preserve. Mm -hmm. The proclamation of the gospel, which is, this sounds a little bit like legal justification to me, mm -hmm. where God has, like in Isaiah 44, 22, return to me because I blotted out your sins. It sounds very much like that. Amen. And the fall of Babylon, the second angel's message, the good news in the second angel's message is that this fall is is connected to God's redemption of his people. Okay, verses 33 to 34, look there. And I encourage you to read the, the entire chapters. They're really rich in this direction. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel are pressed along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have held them fast. They refuse to let them go. Babylon falls because it's persecuting God's people as well and refusing to let them go. Their redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. Why does Babylon fall? They're hanging on, persecuting his people. There is no rest. Mm -hmm. Right, there's the Sabbath. Okay, let's go to chapter 51, verses 36 to 37. And therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will plead your case and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Babylon shall become a heap, a dwelling place for jackals and astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. So there's that promise, you know, referring to the waters drying up, which again is referenced in Revelation, right? The kings of the east, the way the kings of the east is prepared. And then verse 46, um, and lest your heart faint and you fear for the rumor that will be heard in the land, a rumor will come in one year and after that in another year, a rumor will come and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. Are you familiar with what happened historically with Babylon? Cyrus was coming. There was a rumor he was coming. And then there was a, a delay. I forget exactly how long it was. Anybody remember? A Maybe a year? About a year? That's what the text says. When it... <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> was it literal or prophetic? No, it's a... It wasn't 300 years, 365 years. So we see the similar thing happening in Revelation 14 and 18. Yeah. Revelation 14 is almost like a rumor. It's like Babylon is falling mm -hmm. and, and the, it's local. It's the Protestant churches and they're, you know, leave it, people are leaving and coming out. And, but it's not this global picture that we, we see. So um, we're between the two, you know, waiting the second rumor, if you will. Okay, and um, yeah, go ahead. In the middle of this fall, there's a, a call to bring balm to, to heal, to potentially, maybe she'll be healed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then verse 9, this New American Standard, we apply healing to Babylon, but she would not be healed. Mm -hmm. Okay, Revelation 18.21, um, what does that talk about? It's Careful. the end. What? Careful. Careful? <laughs> Is that the timer? No, he's doing it. No, you're good. You can keep going. Revelation 18.21. Yeah, what happens to ba one Babylon is like... What's going to happen to Babylon? What does the angel do? Mm -hmm. It's like a millstone. Run down. Okay. Yeah. Does that remind you of anything Jesus said? Mm -hmm. yeah. Causing little ones to stumble? Okay. Uh, look in Jeremiah 51. Uh, same thing, 63 and 64. Now it shall be when you have finished reading this book. So he's just written all these things about Babylon. Jeremiah has. That you shall tie a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates. Then you shall say, thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her. And they shall be weary. Okay. In closing. And uh, Jerry's going to cover some of this, but he's got other ones too. So... Also there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This message follows the message of the first angel so that this will go, also go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So you see, now Wagner's saying, yes, this joins, it follows, but it's complementary, right? You see that. It is a part of the everlasting gospel, first angel's message, but it has a special significance in view of the fact that the time has come for the closing work of the gospel, what is Babylon? It is spoken of several times in the book of Revelation as a great city. And then he quotes that the great city was divided into the three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his, of his wrath. The original Babylon was a great city so that it would be fitting to represent a city by that name. What are the three forces that joined to form Babylon in the end? Spiritual. Three parts, right? But they're going to be 
divided mm -hmm. as Babylon falls. Interesting. Again, in the 17th chapter, we read of a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet, whose forehead and name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. The woman is said by the angel to be that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. No one earthly city can be said to be the mother of abominations of the earth. Some have been eminent in, in iniquity, but it would not be possible to trace all abominations back to any one of them. When Babylon the Great is destroyed, in her is found every evil and every deed of blood. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain on the earth. Revelation 18.24. All the, all the cities of the nations are more or less the offspring of Babylon the Great. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. yeah. And when she comes and remembers before God, the cities of the nations fall with her, but they are only subjects. Do we see cities falling now? What happened with COVID, with social unrest? We, you see people just starting to want to get out of the city. Um, we read in the book of Isaiah of the king of Babylon and find that he is Satan. Once he was Lucifer, the son of the morning, now he is king of Babylon, prince of darkness. From what we know of the king, we may judge of the kingdom. Babylon the great is the kingdom of Satan. The spirit of Satan is the spirit of the kingdom. Self-exaltation was his ruin. And he quotes Isaiah 12, which we read there. The very attempt to raise self cast Lucifer down from where God had placed him. In seeking to rise, he fell. That's why Babylon falls. If he had sought to humble himself, he would have risen. Christ, whom Lucifer envied, thought it was not a thing to be tenaciously grasped, that he should be equal with God. He gave up all and humbled himself to the death of the cross, wherefore he is highly exalted. The spirit of Satan has always been the characteristic and the destruction of Babylon. In the very beginning of the kingdom, it was, a, it was I don't know, that's not right. It was there anyway. The builders of Babel said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest ye be scattered abroad. It was while their ambitious hearts were planning thus for their own greatness that the Lord came down and frustrated their purpose by confounding their language. So you see he has both aspects of Babel there, right? So the Lord scattered them abroad and we read that text already. On that very site Babylon was built, the, the same spirit was strong in her, but again it brought a fall. It was while Nebuchadnezzar was glorifying himself and we referenced that story as well. Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself and his kingdom was restored, but Belshazzar forgot the lesson while he feasted and glorified himself and his kingdom was divided. Once more, when Babylon the Great is drunk with power and earthly glory, when her sinful ambitions are all realized, when all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, then in her hour of triumph falls once again a voice from heaven, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she has rewarded you and double unto her according to her works in the cup which she has filled. Fill to her double. So remember we, the for making the nations drink, it's a double drinking. Now you have a double retribution of that force that's being applied. Because uh, God is basically, well, self-exaltation just doesn't work. It destroys itself. That's the message. And God is going to demonstrate how that happens. He's going to show how that happens. In the message of the second angel, we learn that to all outward appearance, Babylon is prospering greatly. All nations are serving her. You know, in the, in the first, the popes made themselves powerful by mediation. That's how they did it. You read the two republics. All the civil powers were fighting with each other and the popes were the emissaries of peace. And that's how they did it. Opposition seems hopeless. Yet God's servants are to declare aloud, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It is when Babylon triumphs that she falls. <clears throat> we should never be discouraged when evil seems to be victorious. When the wicked spring is the grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is then that they shall be destroyed forever. Or it is that they should be destroyed forever. So God's servants are to declare boldly, notwithstanding all, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's the spirit of prophecy and the faith of Jesus to say Babylon is fallen while it appears to be yes. highly successful. It was when Babylon fell that Israel went free. Babylon has fallen, therefore it has no power to hold its captives. Amen. So when we proclaim the gospel, it's to come out, it's to set the captives free. The message Babylon has fallen is a strong emphatic call to the prisoners of Satan to go forth and stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has made them free. It means to proclaim deliverance to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and those who join them in the message. It means the experience that belongs such a cry, to such a cry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. 
last paragraph, three paragraphs. That there are prisoners still in Babylon is clear from Revelation 18.4, where the Lord calls upon his people to come out of her and escape her fate. Satan has no power over them. It is Christ who holds the keys of death and the grave. The power of Satan is, is his power to deceive, the power of blinding the eyes, the power of darkness. But the man who walks in the light will not be in darkness, and Satan will not have power over him. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The message of the second angel goes with the everlasting gospel to get men perfectly free from Satan's power. It means entire deliverance from every yoke of bondage. It, you see how it's connected to the first angel's message then. It means entire deliverance from every yoke of bondage. It means having power over all the power of the enemy. Satan has bound many as he has bound the woman who was bowed down by a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. But this message will give deliverance from all such bondage to all who will take it by faith. While Satan appears to be triumphing in the earth, while the churches unite with the world in rejecting the law of God and denying the faith of Christ, believers will with gladness and confidence declare the glad tidings that Babylon is fallen. Many a captive will hear the message and go, free. Well, you could go through each of those historical biblical vignettes and look for the, well, we, we saw some of the cosmic and the historical, the prophetic, uh, and we can feel the corporate. I mean, none of us are immune from self-exaltation mm -hmm. and from having people follow us and lift us up. Mm -hmm. You know, we can all be papists in that mm -hmm. sense. We're all Im not immune to that. So our, and the personal application, even in our marriages and our daily lives, interacting with others and how we, how we approach God. Do we trust him for who he is or do we have some still self-interest in the process? Um, all of those things, I think, speak to us. But the faith of Jesus tells us that Babylon is fallen mm -hmm. and God's desire and his purpose is to set us free from that way of thinking. He's going to uh, do that as we invite him in to dwell in us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we are thankful for the second angel's message. Praise God that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's a definite thing. There's no fear of that system. Um, there's an explanation why Babylon falls. It's understandable. We want the pure grape juice of truth, uh, the life of Christ in us, dwelling in us. Pray that you will uh, give us voices to proclaim this message and hearts to live it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.